Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man's Dame here with me. Um, Going to get the housekeeping out the way. As always, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel if you are on YouTube. <clears throat> if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please be sure to leave a five-star review on the pod. It helps the channel out a ton, helps the both of us out a ton. We're winding down. We've already got one team that punched their ticket to the NBA Finals. I know that's hurting your heart. So, as always, as a yeah. resident Laker fan on the pod, I'm going to give it to you um, to talk about the, the game for this series and really the series as a whole, the Lakers get swept um, against the Nuggets who, who grinded out again in the fourth game. All four games were, were closely contested all the way to the end, but just seemed to have a little bit more juice in the fourth quarter in, in each of those games and just one run that the Lakers just, just can't get over. So what'd you think about game four? What'd you think about the series? As a whole? Well, <clears throat> to start for game four, um, LeBron had a great game, obviously. You know, he had a great first half, 31 points in the first half. And you could definitely tell he was just making a point of being aggressive. Um, I think the strategy was just try to give it all he has, basically, in the first half, try to get a big lead, and hopefully, like, Denver just kind of – not quits, but they're up 3-0. They're up 3-0. They'll be going back to Denver, like, do we really – are we really going to stress this game? But, no, Denver is the greatest team ever. And <laughs> they want to be selfish. They can't just give us one, but – um, yeah, Brian had a great game, but uh, in the second half, I feel like he just got tired because he was pretty much most of our offense. He was operating out of the post a lot, getting to the basket a lot. Um, he did a lot of scoring, obviously, but he was making plays for others out of the post. And like we, we've always said in this podcast, I feel like they're at their best when LeBron has the ball in his hands and is playing out of the post, making plays for others, making plays for himself. So, um, yeah, like I said, he, he it just seemed like he got tired. I think we scored, what, 71 points in the first half. And then had, uh, I think, 38 in the second half, something like that. But the offense clearly just could not get it going in the second half. Denver went on their run. They kind of took the lead and never really looked back. So, like I said, all, all four games was close, but it just seemed like we couldn't close. We couldn't close any of the games. Like, I feel like we were in every single game this series and just could not close it out. And uh, credit to the Nuggets, credit to Jokic. Um, he was great. Hit ridiculous shots again. <laughs> the shots where I saw, I'm like, there's no way. After the first game, I'm like, there's no way he's, they're going to keep hitting these one-legged contested threes. They just kept hitting the one-legged contested <laughs> yeah. threes. But I, like, at some point, bro, you just have to realize, like, they're just a better team. Their two stars play better than our two stars. So, like I said, uh, nothing but respect. Credit to Jokic and the Nuggets. They, they, they deserve to win, for sure. Yeah, I, I've been saying for a while now, I really think that this Nuggets team is – the favorite to win it all, regardless of if it's Miami or Boston pulls off the, the unthinkable and is able to get out of the Eastern Conference Finals, right? This mm -hmm. Denver team is top to bottom. I can't stress it enough how well everybody fits together, how, like we've talked about a lot before, right? The best teams, you could pencil in those star players for stat lines. You could almost pencil in Jokic for, at minimum, a 20-point triple-double. He's right. had in the – what is it? So he played five games against uh, Minnesota, six against mm -hmm. Phoenix, four here. So that's 15 games. He had eight triple-doubles. <laughs> More than 50% of the games he's played, he's put up triple-doubles. Eight triple-doubles in this postseason alone with mm -hmm. minimally four games left. It's that's like crazy. he's on pace to have double-digit triple-doubles in a single postseason run. That is ridiculous, bro. And two of those series aren't even hadn't didn't even go past five games. That's the main part. Like, he, yeah, they, and he's closing these series out kind of quick. So it's yeah. like, damn, that's crazy. <clears throat> yeah. So in this game, 30, uh, 30, 14, and thirteen assists as well. Just humongous stat line from him. He, as always, like we already mentioned, um, the shot making from this team. It's unbelievable to watch at times that Jokic one being like the pinnacle moment. One leg is falling away. I got a <laughs> flashback to Dirk. He got the leg out, fading right. away, um, and just cashed it. And uh, ridiculous, man. Yeah, I think, you know, Darvinham made the adjustment as he did in, in game three, changing up the starting lineup, changes it up again here, um, puts Rui into the starting lineup. Uh, benches D'Lo has Schroeder come in as the, the guard. So that's just the biggest lineup they've run all year. 
um, with, with LeBron, Rui, and AD going three through five there. And even saw a shakeup to the rotation as a whole. You know, Lonnie Walker got, you know, seven minutes in this game. Jared Vanderbilt got a DMP. We saw Tristan Thompson minutes in the <laughs> Western <was> Conference Finals <laughs> in 2023. This man was on ESPN. And was playing <laughs> like, well. Dude, and he was giving us good minutes, too. Good hustle, good energy. He Like, bro, he was playing well. I'll give him credit. It was funny when I first seen him check into the game. I'm like, there's no way we're that down bad that we're looking for Tristan Thompson in 2023 to help us out. But he was he was doing well. I can't even I can't even hate at it. Dude, I saw they gave him a post touch, like ran a play to clear out the block and said, <laughs> "Here, Tristan." In a go- uh... winner go home game in the Western Conference Finals in the year of 2023, Tristan Thompson had a play ran for him. That's how I knew. That's when I knew we were cooked. Bro. <laughs> we're running plays for Tristan Thompson. We're cooked, bro. We're yeah. good. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> Um, so yeah, look, this is another moment where, like you said, Denver is not only, I think, a better team overall and deeper team, this is the team, like their core has been together for a while, but additionally, you know, they've been playing at this level since training camp. They didn't have any big shakeups, you know, to their rotation or their roster, really the only people they brought in from the trade deadline was Thomas Bryan. And then Reggie Jackson came in off of the the buyout market. Neither one of them saw meaningful minutes really in the series. So this is the the team, the core that they've ran with from, you know, August when you're starting training camp, right? This Lakers team was thrown together at the trade deadline and did not have that same amount of cohesion. And so, it's harder to find these types of lineups when, again, you're just scrambling to try to find things. You're already down in the series. Credit to Darvin Ham again for t- just trying, right? Like 3-0, mm-hmm. what do you have to lose? He makes a, the decision to start really, like I said, bench D'Lo, didn't play Vanderbilt. Um, and, again, the game was close and contested as all of these games were, um, which I honestly don't know that I can remember a more exciting sweep. <laughs> In the postseason, right. <laughs> like every single game was close down to the wire, even in, you know, game one where the Nuggets got out to a really hot start, were up by 20. That game was down to a three point lead multiple times there late in the fourth. So the Lakers fight back in this in game four. The, the Lakers are up, what, 12 at halftime, 14, something like that. We're up like 14. Right. Nuggets come out huge third quarter. They win the quarter 36 to 16. Um, and get right back in the lead um, going into the fourth quarter. And then it's just like blow for blow, grinding it out in the fourth quarter. So I think the most entertaining sweep of all time, at least that I can think of at least in, in recent memory. But yeah, to your point, LeBron came out 31 points in the first half. And this is most points in a half in his career. Clearly fatigued him. Um, mm-hmm. he, he was walking to the locker room with like 12 seconds to go in, in the half. Just, absolutely tired you can see it as soon as the third quarter started just his body language started settling wasn't as aggressive he just he's 38 right yeah you can't expect him to be able to dominate a game for 48 minutes like he used to be able to do mm-hmm. other time is truly undefeated so and he still was playing good defense in that second half he was guarding Jokic. he switched on to jamal murray a little bit in that fourth quarter like he's still mm-hmm. like because he left it all out there. Like, you can't 100%. say nothing about his performance. Whether he had a good offensive scoring second half, it's like, what can you expect out of a 38-year-old? You know what I mean? So Exactly. Um, and so it's tough. 40 points, one assist side of a 40-point triple-double in an elimination game, and it's it's not enough. The, the last possession, you know, they run kind of the pin-down screen for him, get him driving to his left. And credit to Jamal Murray and Aaron Gordon, who – Played phenomenal defense there, got hands on the ball and contested the shot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't think the Lakers have too much to be ashamed of. Obviously, nobody wants to get swept, obviously. But, again, all of these games were close. All of them were in contention. It always felt like there was one Denver run in the third quarter or the fourth quarter that the Lakers just couldn't match, Right. Right. And that happened in every single game. So obviously you wish you could have those moments back. But I said going in, I thought Denver was a better team. I had them in seven. I 
it still it was a very competitive series. They just couldn't get a single one out of it. So um, what are your thoughts on Anthony Davis in this series? Because I've seen a lot of takes going towards, you know, he didn't do enough, especially in game four with how hard LeBron was playing, how much of the scoring output he accounted for. He felt like some people felt like Anthony Davis was coasting. I feel like, again, if you even look at his stats from this game, game two aside, where he only had 18. He had the, you know, the 40 point game in game one, 28 in game three, um, 21 and 14 here in game four had insane amounts of defensive presence. Like he was clearing away the best defensive player on the floor in this mm-hmm. series and this entire postseason, he's been the best defensive player. So, I don't want to cut him too much slack, but at the same time, I feel like he's doing his job. All right. Like he's never, ever, ever been that guy who is demanding the ball in the post, who is some super high volume scorer. Mm -hmm. He is a defensive specialist who has a phenomenal skill set to also be able to score on the offensive end. Granted, it would be great if you put up, 30 plus 40 plus in each of these games because that lessens the load that LeBron has to carry or that some of the other role players are going to have to carry. But I'm not going to go as far as to say that he had a bad series by any means. I think he played great in all four games, game two being his worst game, but even that game four uh, what is this in game two, uh, four blocks and a steal his rim presence, uh, his rim protection and his presence around the rim was great in this entire series. So I don't know. I just want to know what your thoughts are on AD because I've seen conflicting opinions and, and a lot of people I feel like have been real more critical of his play in this series than I think it is warranted. I don't think that people realize how much of a task it is being the one that has to guard the best player in the world for an entire series and then and be basically our anchor to the whole Lakers defense. Like there is Andy no Davis other rim protection on the Lakers roster besides him. None at all. None at all. Like LeBron doesn't even really count because he, I mean, he gets chased down blocks, but he, he's not a rim protector like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, like I said, yeah, I don't think people realize what Anthony Davis's job is to do or how difficult his job is, I should say, as far as you're asking this guy to go out there and guard Jokic. Like I've seen takes like, oh, yeah, just let him guard Jokic one on one, slow him down a little bit. But then also we need 30 and 20 out of you. And then you're our best rebounder on the team. So it's like you're asking a lot out of this guy when like you're, you're asking this guy to be the best player in the world right now. Like be the best player on defense, but also go out and outplay Jokic on offense. It's like you can't you can't ask for all that. Like and especially with this Lakers team, like we talked about before, this team was kind of thrown together at the trade deadline. So with that slow start, basically, mm-hmm. we've been playing playoff basketball since the All-Star break. Like right. a lot of teams like the Nuggets, the Nuggets, the second half of the, the season kind of packed it in a little bit. Like they lost some games that they shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, They rested some players because like they already locked up the one seed. They knew that they need to be healthy and ready for the playoffs. The Lakers did not have that luxury because of that slow start. We've been playing playoff basketball literally since the all-star break. So I feel like that caught up to the Lakers a little bit. Um, You seen as a whole, the team was just worn down. The team as a whole was just tired. And while the, the Nuggets always seem to have a little bit more energy, that l- a little extra burst, you know what I mean? So, and with Anthony Davis, like, he's our only big on the team. Like, it's, it's a lot on his plate. Like you said, we're yeah. not trying to give him a pass, but guarding Yoga is, is, a, is a tall task in itself. So if you pair that with trying to go out on the offensive end and give you, what, 30, 35 points a night, it's like, it's tough for anybody to do. So, um, like I said, I'm not giving him a pass, but, I don't feel like he played bad this series. I feel like he had a great postseason. Yeah, he had some inconsistent games, but I I felt like he had a great postseason. Yeah, I, like I said, from a defensive perspective, far and away, in my opinion, has been the best defensive player in the postseason. Um, and even in game four, the shots that Jokic made are very difficult shots for the most right. part. Um, and they were making him work. And this is one of Jokic's more inefficient games of the season, right? 11 of 24, below 50% um, from the field. So you can't ask for much more. Like the great players are going to be able to make great shots. And when it boils down to it more than anything, I think the series is just the result is based on cohesion of how long the Nuggets have been together compared to the Lakers. 
and just top to bottom talent. This Nuggets team is is really good, and I, I think finally more people in the you know the NBA fan space are starting to give them the respect they deserve. It should not have taken this long, but mm-hmm. you know this is what happens when you like we've touched on in some of our, our previous episodes. Keep a core of guys together. You continue to find piece of people that fit through free agency. You're not always looking to make this big splash move. Um, I saw a report came out a couple of days ago where apparently a few years ago they were looking to potentially move Jamal Murray for a bigger name. Um, and Mike Malone got into it with the GM saying, like, no, we need to, we need to do this the right way. Right. We have our guy. We're going to keep our guy. We're going to develop him. Um, and you know, they're, you know, reaping the, the benefits of it now. Um, and you know, his play, I think he had average 30 points a game this series, um, on 50, 40, 90 splits. So him, in addition to Jokic had a phenomenal series, Porter in spots, um, Aaron Gordon he is in this game had 22 points, three of five from three. Um, so again, that, like we talked about before, trying to knowing that they want to put AD on him and, and trying to keep making him a shooter. Yeah. Tip your cap. He knocked down his shots. Um, mm-hmm. and it was great at attacking closeouts the entire series, especially when it's guys like D or Reeves coming out to contest him, um, being able to, to drive the ball to the paint, put a shoulder in their chest and get to the rim. So yeah, credit to this Nuggets team. This is, is well-deserved for their franchise. I hope that it finally a stops the narrative that, you know, like Jokic was undeserving of any of these MVP awards because what does he have to show for? No playoff success, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like they're dumb. They're just bad takes. <laughs> um, so hopefully all of that has calmed down. I also, something that got brought up that I saw recently after last year's playoff run um, when they lost to the Warriors in the second round, ESPN was running segments on like first take saying, can you win with Jokic as your number one option as a center because of how much he can get exploited on the defensive side of the ball? Because in that series, the Warriors just constantly put him in the pick and roll and just mm-hmm. really decimated the, the Denver defense that way. To his credit, some of it is coaching, right? Like they did a lot more to try to keep him out of those actions as best as possible. But he played them, I think, much better in this series. In the postseason as a whole, he's definitely stepped up his play on the defensive side of the ball. I think he's always had active hands. He's had good deflection numbers as a, as a center. Um, and you can see that just trying to disrupt any passes into the pocket, trying to, to get up and show and drop back into the roller. So I think he did a great job. So hopefully that narrative is done too. I don't think he's a horrible defender. By no means is he a great rim protector or elite, you know, defender at the center spot but combining how capable he can be on the defensive end and serviceable at times with being arguably one of if not the best offensive bigs we've ever seen in the sport Mm -hmm. of basketball is well more than enough to clearly show that he can be the number one option on what again to me is the favorite to be the nba champion and they are now four wins away from accomplishing that 100%. 100%. Um, I feel like, like you said, the knock on him was his defense, Um, basically saying that he was a liability on defense. And at least in this postseason, he has not been a negative on the defensive end. Now, I'm not saying he's been a defensive stopper, but mm-hmm. he's not been a negative on the defensive end. And when you, like you said, when you pair that with the fact that he is the best offensive player in the league and is the whole offensive engine for this team, brings you rebounding, scoring whenever he wants to, facilitating, running the entire offense. It's like you can live with him being out there on the defensive end. Like I said, it's not a negative. It's not you got to hide him on the defensive end. He can he he's been more than holding his own in this postseason as far as him on the defensive end. So all those narratives, they were all stupid to begin with. Like even like you said, when they lost to the Warriors, wasn't that the year that they had Jamal Murray hurt, Michael Porter Jr. hurt? It's like right. they on, weren't bro. gonna win that series. They anyway. weren't like exactly. So like what are we even talking about? Like I, I feel like a lot of people think that or thought that Jokic was getting a lot of excuses. For his past postseason, I'm not even going to call them failures. It's just he didn't make it far. But I feel like they a lot of them were warranted. The team was young early in his career when they made it to, like, the bubble year when they made it to the Western Conference Finals. It's like they ran into a better Lakers team. And then the year where Jamal Murray was hurt, Michael Porter Jr. was hurt, it's like you can't expect him to carry this team to the finals all by himself. Like, that's not how this works. It is a team game. So 
Right. Because there's no, it's no, you shouldn't have no shame in losing to a team that's better than you. Like, it's just, it is what it is. You just got to tip your cap. So, mm-hmm. like I said, the Nuggets, they should be favored. Um, they're, they're a great team. The roster is just, they're built so perfect. Like, they, they seem like a very balanced team. They don't really have holes, like, on their, in their entire roster. It's, yeah. It, it was insane to see, I'm going to be honest. So, credit to the Nuggets, definitely. Yeah, so – Last kind of look on the, the Lakers here going into the offseason. Um, have to touch on it because LeBron brought it up in his postgame press conference that he has decisions that he needs to mull over about retirement. Um, just said that he has things he needs to think through. I genuinely do not see a world where he retires after getting swept in the playoffs. No shot. It just doesn't seem right. And if he did, I wouldn't believe that he wouldn't unretire. Um, obviously, the first theory that people are thinking of is that if he does retire, he's going to wait for Bronny and just go join whatever team Bronny goes to. I don't know about that, mm-hmm. but um, I don't think he's retiring. I, I would buy more into the fact that he may be saying this to, again, try to get some additional leverage on the front office to make sure that we're keeping the goal in mind. Like We need to be reconstructing this roster to win now. It's always got to be a win now, which it should always be when you have LeBron on your team, no matter what his age is. Um, because if he has anything left in the tank, like we saw, still can put up 31 points and a half, still can give you 40 point triple doubles in a win or go home situation. That mm-hmm. roster is more, more, you know, has more time together, a few different role players potentially to, to slot in this could be a different series. So going into next year, they have a lot that they can, can try to do in terms of um, retooling this roster. I think the only people that are under contract for them next year is a uh, big name contract, at least obviously is LeBron. Um, AD is an extension candidate. Um, Vanderbilt is also going to be extension eligible for the whole season. A big free agent name for them which is crazy to say, it's going to be Austin Reeves. Um, yeah, pay that man. Whatever he wants, pay that man. Yeah, so uh, he's going to – I think he's going to be a very hot commodity, um, similar to guys like uh, Caleb Martin right now, two guys, two <laughs> role players who I think are playing themselves into a very nice payday with their postseason play, similar mm-hmm. to what Jalen Brunson was able to do last year. So he's going to be, I'm sure, a very hotly contested free agent, but – the Lakers, I would imagine, would love to have him back. Um, and I think that would be a worthwhile move to make it move to make, even if they have to, you know, pay a little bit more than they would have liked to or planned on earlier. Um, because we saw he was capable of shouldering some scoring load, capable of running, mm-hmm. you know, candling the ball in the pick and roll, um, and provided very, very quality minutes for them, turning into a starter in the postseason here um for the Lakers. So that's going to be a key free agent for them to try to retain moving forward. Um, what do you think about D'Lo moving forward? He is uh, he can avoid free agency since he's extension eligible all the way through the end of June, um, but potential for him to go to an undrafted free agent deal if that doesn't get done. So what would you like to see the Lakers do with D'Lo moving forward? Um, so basically uh, D'Lo's whole situation for me depends on what we do in the off season. As far as I, I like I said, talking about the LeBron retirement thing, I don't think he's retiring. I believe that it is the it, he's trying to have a little bit of leverage against the the front office so that they can make some sort of move. But hopefully, I feel like hopefully I want the Lakers to not panic because the last time we got bounced by the Suns, we kind of panicked and felt like oh we need to make a big move and then we traded for Russell Westbrook and then we saw how that worked out. So hopefully the Lakers don't panic. We just seen how the Nuggets kept their team together. They were patient. You know, they develop their guys and you see where they are now. So mm-hmm. um, I would love to sign Austin Reeves back, Rui Hachimura. I hope we sign both of them. I feel like we need to bring those guys back because they're both young. Like Austin Reeves is only going to get better. Rui should only get better. It's not like these guys are old and capped out. Like these guys, you develop these guys, they should only get better from here. But um, as far as D'Lo, uh, that one, that one is a little tough because I don't know the money that he's going to be asking for, but. If he's going to be unplayable in the playoffs, it's just it doesn't seem like it's going to be the right move to sign him to a big deal. Um, I, I think he can help in the regular season, especially with Anthony Davis being a little bit of injury prone. 
LeBron James obviously being older. I don't see LeBron playing a lot of minutes. If he when he comes back this next season, I don't see him playing a lot of minutes. Hopefully he he caps out around like thirty two minutes a night in the regular season because I, I just feel like he needs to preserve himself for the playoffs. So in that aspect, I think D'Lo could be a valuable piece to have, help you win regular season games. So we're not so we're just staying afloat basically till the playoffs come. But yeah, man, with D'Lo, it's it's just tough. And the Lakers have also been linked to, you know, Kyrie Irving. I've seen that they're now linked to a Trey Young trade. So obviously if we bring one of those guys, then D has gone. But yeah. even then, I don't know if I even want a Kyrie or a Trey Young, because that means probably getting rid of either Austin Reeves or Rui. Or if somehow you get Kyrie or Trey Young to take less money and you keep Reeves and Rui, that means the entire bench is gonna be me, you, and some people from down the street. Right. Like, <laughs> it's gonna be nobody. So yeah. I don't know if I really like that. So if we don't get one of those big name guys, which I honestly, I, I don't think I really want one of those big name guys for the money that they're going to be asking. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be opposed to bringing D-Lo back, but it's, like I said, it's just tough, man. Like when the postseason comes around, it's hard to play a guy who's a negative on a defensive end because when he's not hitting shots, he's literally unplayable like we've seen in this playoff series. So uh, it, it's tough. Hopefully maybe he can, you bring him back, he can buy in a little bit on the defensive end. I don't know how likely that is with him being, I think, 28 years old this later into his career. People don't really change. Like, by this point, you kind of know who guys are. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if he, if he comes in, if he hits shots, then, he, I, I said, like I said, he could help us definitely in the regular season. And then hopefully in the playoffs, he just he, he ends up making shots and he could be, at least be a positive on the offensive end. For sure. I, uh, I can see where the thought process to try to bring in a guy like Kyrie or, like you said, the trade rumors for Trey Young because the Lakers, I think, could benefit from a closer, right? Like 100%. going into next year, your closer is going to be a 39-year-old LeBron. Austin Reeves, that's our closer. Right, or <laughs> role players like that stepping up in him, you know, really trying to take another step up in his game, so – I understand the thought process there. It's tough with the, you know, already having two huge contracts with LeBron and AD on the roster, trying to fit a third one in for a guy like Kyrie. Like you said, that really is going to put them in a very tight space with the cap. And something I heard them talking about on Through the Wire, which is, I don't think I've ever thought about this way, but is really where the league is going. There aren't that many old vets that you can just sign for the minimum these days like there used to be like you think back to a few years ago there was a a large amount of vets that you could bring in on veteran minimum deals who would ring chase but that were good right and there aren't as many of those guys now right like jr smith is out the league carmelo just retired which we'll touch on later um you know boogie is playing in puerto rico um like the league has gotten more young to fill some of those role player spots. And a lot more teams are keeping younger guys to fill that void. And I know we kind of had a longer conversation about this earlier is why that is the case. And I genuinely do think just the talent level has gotten better. In addition to that, probably the youth aspect, you know, you have the potential that plays into that and you're essentially developing them into to being more than what they already are. So I just, I don't think the market for veteran, you know, minimum guys is, as big at least as it used to be when you know we look like 10 plus years ago or like even on like LeBron James Heat teams you got Mike Miller and Shane Batty Shane you Batty, can yeah, find yeah, a guys, bunch of yeah. guys who are later into their career get them to sign mm-hmm. for like a million dollar deal and they just are the glue pieces that construct the last bit of the roster there so I think if there's a bigger market it would be easier to say like yeah, we, we need to go in, or the Lakers need to go and get one more guy to be that kind of closer to have a bigger offensive presence that then allows AD to kind of slot in nicely as a third option instead of a second mm-hmm. option um, and can continue to be the dominant defender that he is. So I don't know. Do you have faith in Rob Polinka? I think he's completely convinced a large portion of the Lakers fans that I wanted him gone after the moves he made at the trade deadline. So He's gonna um, have to gonna have to pick up that phone and make some more deals this summer. Uh, Rob Polink is hit or miss with me, man. Because if he doesn't make this trade at the deadline, it's like he, I'd have been calling for him to be out of here, you know. Because basically, like we talked about before, wasted the whole first half of the season. 
which caused us to tr play catch up and which caused us to be tired in the playoffs. You know what I mean? Everything comes at a, at a cost eventually. So, um, like I said, the the main things I just want bring Austin Reeves back, bring Rui back, and do not panic and feel like we absolutely cannot win without Kyrie. I do feel like it would be great that like in a perfect world where we don't have to get rid of Reeves, Rui, we can keep Vando, and and then sign Kyrie Irving in a perfect world where money is not a thing, then that obviously would be great. You know, we get a closer, we get another scorer, we get a scorer from the perimeter because LeBron James being our closer is a little bit tough when he's 39 years old and his only way to score really because he can't shoot is to drive to the basket. Yeah. Later in the fourth quarter when he's tired, you obviously see he can't drive to the basket with mm -hmm. that same efficiency. So getting another closer, another perimeter scorer like Kyrie Irving obviously would help, but I just feel like what he would cost wouldn't work in the long run because like say we sign Kyrie Irving maybe we keep Reeves we gotta let go of Rui or whatever we fill the bench out with a bunch of whoever's Kyrie gets hurt we're done LeBron gets hurt we're done AD gets hurt we're done you know what I mean like we've seen how this how this this way of building a team has worked before mm -hmm. you're it's it's a high risk high reward thing because one of your star, your stars go down you're done yeah. And with LeBron being 39 years old, Anthony Davis already being injury prone, and not to mention Kyrie Irving is not the healthiest guy in the world either. Kyrie Irving also has has deal, dealt with injuries. So, yeah, it's, it's – honestly, it's tough. I, it's funny because it's it, this is not going to happen at all. But if you really, really say you want to win your fifth ring, why not take a little pay cut if you're LeBron James? Why not take a picture? Yeah. If you if you know what it takes, he to don't need the money. I promise, he does not. And that's need what I'm the money. saying. You're a billionaire. You don't <laughs> need the money. You want Kyrie Irving. You know Kyrie Irving's going to demand big money. Kyrie Irving's not taking a pay cut. But you still know you you need to keep these role players, these rotational pieces, the Austin Reeves, the Rui Hachimura's. Why not take a pay cut? You know what I mean? You're like you're already considering retirement. You might play. I think LeBron has max two years left in the league, and I think he's gone. Why not take a pay cut? If you really want to win that fifth ring, you really want to take this load off of yourself as far as this scoring load. Because, you know, when you bring Kyrie Irving in, that's a lot of scoring that he could take off of his plate, basically. Yeah. That's a lot of closing that he doesn't have to do at his age. So, listen, I know it's not going to happen, but if I'm LeBron James, why not even consider that? It's a fair point. It's definitely a fair point. It would definitely give them a lot more flexibility to construct a full roster. So, Rob Palenka's got a lot, a lot of work to do this summer. Yeah. Um, so, I also, I also think we need, uh, we need some big man depth too. Like, I, I don't like Anthony Davis being the only big man on our team. Like, yeah. cause he's not even really. And that's another thing. He's not even a like center banging with Jokic now. Like in Jokic the playoffs, is muscling like, him. Jokic is a legit seven foot center. Anthony Davis is six ten, six eleven, with like a slim frame. Anthony right, Davis not is not a, big, a center. Yeah. Like. And he's still playing, I think, great defense on Jokic. Like, obviously, you can't stop him. You can only hope to slow him down a little bit. But we need a real center on the roster and real backup center depth because Anthony Davis already being hurt is bad enough. But now you're going to make him play the five all year long, bang with the bigs, and then expect him to stay healthy? Like, that's that's not going to happen. So that's another thing that needs to happen this offseason. But I don't know, it, it's tough the way the money's looking right now. Yeah. So probably the last time we talk about the Lakers for a little while. So you want to give any any closing thoughts on this <sighs> season? Two and ten to the Western Conference Finals. Floor is yours. Listen, man, we started two and ten. You know, the season was lost. I was done. I was ready to give up on this season come all-star break. Even when we made the trades, I was like, all right, we might win a couple games, but it is what it is. We start playing well. I start believing again. LeBron gets hurt. Then we start playing well without LeBron. Austin Reeves becomes a star. Listen, man, I, I love this Lakers team. I really do. Like, this Lakers team, it was fun to watch this whole year. Well, no, the second half of the year. It was a fun team to watch. You know, we overachieved a lot, you know, 2-10 to the Western Conference Finals. So, it is what it is. We lost to the better team. Hopefully, we just come back next year and we, we come back strong, man. We beat the Warriors. The Clippers got eliminated. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. As long as the Celtics lose, we good. I'm happy. <laughs> it's trending that way. We can we can go ahead and get right into that series. The Celtics, with their backs against the wall, also had the potential to get swept, swept like the Lakers. Came out and responded in Miami, get one back. 
um, and, and force a game five in this series. Obviously, as history indicates, they don't really have a chance. Um, no team ever come, came back from an 0-3 deficit in the NBA. I think it's happened once in baseball, twice or three times in hockey, something like that. So Three or four in hockey. Right. Across sporting in general, the odds are well stacked against them. And across basketball, it's never been done before. But um, they were able to pull one back last night in Miami, winning 116-99. to Tatum had a, a good response game, 33 points, 11 rebounds, seven assists, a steal, and a block. Um, glad to see he got some a good volume of shots up, not just because he helped me hit the over in my parlay last night, <laughs> um, but but that's what you need from your, your star players in, in moments like that. I think him and Jalen Brown um, both had good games. Jalen Brown was off to a rough start, but definitely had a big third quarter and fourth quarter for them. Um, and, and Tatum obviously closing the game out really well there down the stretch. Um, and, and on the Heat side of things, uh, just a lot of shots I felt like that that fell for them in this series didn't drop last night. Jimmy missed some contested layups, missed some some jumpers. Bam did not have a great game. That aggressive Bam that we had seen in games one through three uh, only put up seven shots last night. Um, only 10 points, five rebounds, no assists from Bam. Um, so they uh, just – shots were not dropping for them at the rate that they had been for not even just the series, but the postseason as, as a whole. Um, so you got to tip your cap to the Celtics defense there. Um, and I think what I had mentioned the last time we reported about them playing faster – um, it was a huge difference in this game, not even just from a fast break perspective. They almost doubled the Heat's fast break points in this game, which I said would be huge. But additionally, even again, just off of a uh, off of a make made basket, getting the ball up the court quick, not letting the Heat get set into their man defense or their zone defense or any type of schemes that they're trying to run um, and attacking very quickly because in a half court set, that Heat defense is arguably the best in the league in terms of how many looks they can throw at you, how um, well they all play off of one another and rotate for each other. So um, I think the Celtics did a much better job there of playing with pace. Um, and then obviously more important than anything, you have Tatum stepping up in a big game um, and, and avoiding the sweep here for Boston. So what did you think of the game last night? And I'm going to pose the question, do you think there is a chance that they're able to, to find a way to rattle off four straight here against Miami? Well, starting with the game last night, I just felt like it came down to them hitting shots. You know, Celtics are – they shoot a lot of threes. You know, they're normally a good sh three-point shooting team. So, last night, that's what happened. They they ended up making a lot of shots. They got contributions from a lot of people off the bench. They got Grant Williams making threes. Al Horford made a couple. So, that's really what it is. When you're a team that live and dies by the three-point that by the three point shot, you know, when they fall, it's great. But, obviously, when they're not falling, like the first three games of the series, you know, it's easy for you guys to lose. So, I feel like that was the main point, that along with, like you said, the fact that the Heat weren't really making shots that they normally were making this series. So, I mean, I, I didn't take much out of this win. I mean, I guess it was good to see them have some fight because after game three, getting blown out like that, I yep. thought that they were just going to pack it in and they were done. So, I mean, if you're a Celtics fan, it's good to see that your team actually has some fight, has some pride, and it wasn't going to go out uh, getting swept. But <laughs> as far as their chances to come back in the series, Slim to none. You know, I, I if you're going to tell me they're going to shoot 40% from the three-point line the rest of these games, then, like we said, they are the better team talent-wise. I, th I think pretty much everyone can agree with that. But just the way they've been playing, even though even though they made threes this game, I don't, I just don't like the way their offense is run. It seems like it's a lot of ISO. It's a lot of five out. And I'm not. they don't get bad looks. They get good looks from three. But it's it's easy to go cold from the three-point line. Like, you know, when they're not falling, it is tough, especially when the – especially the way their offense is run. So um, I, I don't I don't see them coming back in this series. Like you said, no team has ever done that. And if I'm being honest, I don't think – I think that record is going to stand. I don't think no team – in basketball, I don't think no team is going to come back from 0-3 unless there is, a, like, obviously a significant injury right. to the team's best player or something like that. But being healthy, both teams, I, I don't I don't think I ever will predict a team to come back from 0-3. So – yeah, it's, it's it's not looking good. I mean, they are going back home. You might be able to put some pressure on them if you win this game. But even then, the Celtics haven't been a great home team. Right. That's exactly <laughs> so, what I was going to so say. It's like, like, 
you can't even like bank on the fact that you're going home because you yeah. just blew the first two games at home to this team. So yeah, I don't see a world where they come back. I think I, I would not be surprised if the Heat just close it out in uh in five. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't I don't think it's gonna gonna happen. Rattling off four straight, um, uh, you know, even if they were a good home team, that game six in Miami would be very, very tough. Right. But they have a worse home playoff record than they do on the road. So they have to have two more at home. Um, you know, obviously winning game five and game seven at home if they're able to pull this off. Um, and I just – at this point, right, you just need one more game from the Heat where they have another good shooting night. Um, you get – because they had pretty consistent production, like I said, from their role players. You know, Gabe Martin had 16 in this game. Um, rough shooting night for guys like Duncan Robinson. Kyle Lowry was two for eight from the field. So even Max Struess, only nine points, gave Vincent 17. He rolls his ankle there in the fourth. So hopefully he's not, if he does have to miss time, it's not too much. But uh, he's been huge for them this entire postseason in this, this series particularly. So I don't see a world where it happens. If they were able to do it, a lot of people are going to have to, to – <laughs> eat some crow because they've been on Missoula's head. They've been on both the Jays head. Like rightfully so though. No, rightfully some so of it is that. definitely warranted for sure. Um I think the Missoula stuff gets overblown too much. Um but yeah I just <laughs> I'm just glad they were able to get one because we have a game tomorrow because if they would have lost we wouldn't have basketball for a week. <laughs> right. Yeah that'd have been pretty bad. So as a as just a basketball fan Thank you, Boston. I would love to see them keep winning. I just don't see uh, don't see it happening. If they're able to do it, I will get back up here on this podcast and easily apologize to the city of Boston <laughs> and every single player on that roster and the coaching staff. But but honestly, would we even have to? All right, let's say hypothetically they do come back, they win. Do we really have to apologize for just going with the trend of 150 teams have lost <laughs> down 0-3? Like. Is that really – are we really disrespecting them or is it just like we're just going off of what has happened? Like, you can't be mad at – like, if you're a Boston fan, you can't be mad at us for saying, oh, yeah, the series is done. No team has ever done it. Yeah, well, I think some of the players feel disrespected because you saw some of the quotes that they were saying, you know, don't let us get one. Yeah. We get don't one, lose we're going to get one. <laughs> don't lose – yo, bro, you can't – like, <laughs> you cannot say that. And that was after the game that they got 30-piece yeah. in Miami. You can't say something like we're disrespecting you because you were down 3 <laughs> You're down. You're the one that did it. Play better. You can't be mad at us. Just play better. That is true. That, that is funny. That but is true. It, it was crazy too because I feel like there hasn't even been like a Jimmy Butler game. You know what I mean? One of those games where he goes off for 45 and takes over and wins the game by himself. And you know it's going to happen. Like you know it's bound to happen. So even if – let's say they win this one. They win this one in Boston. They're, they're, I don't see a world where this series gets past six. I just don't. Like, there's there's no way I feel like they're going to win this series. I, I think I think Michael Jordan will refuse to let that happen. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think even if it goes to game six, right, you get back to your home floor, crowd's going to be rocking. You have a chance to go back to the finals for the first time since 2020 mm. and, and avenge your loss against Boston last year. Um, if they aren't able to put on game five, I feel like game six for sure. If it goes to a game seven. Nah, oh if it goes seven. I'm about to say it now. If it goes seven. Because that Boston team, they got the game seven record breaker right now. <laughs> yeah. I'll, if it goes seven, he might go for 52. You never know. He might want to break his own record. Um, but, but yeah, I, we could save the, the finals preview for Saturday pod. <laughs> Um, when the series is – I think it will be decided by then, right, because they play Thursday Thursday, and, and then Saturday, Saturday potentially. So maybe not. Um, they're going to close it out. They're going to close it out. So we'll, we'll save the, the full final preview for when we have a definitive answer for who's coming out of the East. But um, I can tell you right now, I've got Denver over either of these teams. 1,000. Probably, honestly, does not matter. Six games. Right now, Denver just looks too complete, man. They just yeah. they got the best player on the planet. They got a great number two. 
top tier number yeah. two, solid role play. Like we we talked about, listen, we can't give the Nuggets any more respect than we haven't already given them. Like we know what the Nuggets are. Like they're they they should be favored to beat both of these teams. Yeah, hundred um, percent. But I, I it's funny, dude. I do want to say because I remember you said uh you feel you feel like this Joe Mazzulla stuff is getting a little bit overblown. Uh, isn't it kind of crazy though to see like how much coaching matters in in basketball, like. Regardless of whether like uh, he deserves a lot of his hate that he's getting because like we've talked about already he's not even supposed to be here like I'm not I'm not mad that he, you're not out coaching Spo like you're not supposed to be here but, right like, it has been crazy to see how much coaching really matters like we've known it we've known it to be true but like if you didn't believe it before this is this is proof right here like coaching right. is a he makes a huge difference in these series. Yeah, I, I think where my issue with the criticism comes from is it's the same problems that we've seen with, from the Celtics team as of late in the past few years, right? Those lapses of focus where they seem to take their foot off the gas. They have these stretches where they their offense looks so inconsistent, stretches where their defense looks like they have no idea what's going on and teams are going off to huge runs. That happened under Brad Stevens. That happened under Ime. It's happening under Joe Mazzulla, but because it's happening in this playoff series and obviously they were down all three, they're like, this guy's in way over his head. But mm -hmm. like it's every if it's happening under every coach and there's one constant, it's the players. Right. Like they have things that they have to work on too. We can be critical of, of Joe Mazzulla, and I am critical of him in some aspects. The timeout thing is I think an issue, I think he does like to give his players too much of a leash. I understand wanting them to try to play through it and figure it out. But again, like we've said with Spolstra, Celtics would go on. Even last night, they came out of one of the timeouts, four quick points. He called another timeout. Mm. We're not just going to let this game get blown out. Like I'm going to do everything within my power as a coach to try to keep this game in striking distance and not let it get out of hand. Missoula at times just lets it go on and on and on. And then it gets to a point where – you call the timeout, but geez, it just went on a 14 to two run. Right. That might wrap up the game at that point. So, um, and this is just from a personal perspective, the whole high volume amount of threes that he likes to coach and, and live by. I'm not the biggest fan of it from a, a scheme perspective, but that's how it, it, you know they play when it works like it did last night and you make 18 to 45, you're going to win most of your games. And they won 57 mm -hmm. games in the regular season. So I'm not going to let one, if they, like, they're training to lose this series, make me feel like, oh, my gosh, Joe Mazzulla is a bad coach. He can't coach in the NBA. He literally got the interim job September 22nd. The NBA season started on October 1st. He had eight days. Eight days and still won 57 games, locked up the two seed in the East. He's clearly capable. All right. If they would have had this roster and then – they miss the plan. That's a whole different conversation. Mm -hmm. But he's capable. He's got his guys playing good. You can see the difference in offensive style from Ime to Joe, which is, again, credit to the coaching. He's able to get his guys to buy into his brand of basketball. Lots of ball rotations off of driving kicks. Good to great shots, finding the open three. Right. Cool. So I think that, that's where my issue lies. Is it feels like coaches become so much of a scapegoat Anytime a team that isn't expected to win loses, it's just like, oh, it's the coach's fault. It's the coach's fault. And, and some of it is, but the coaches can't get on the court and play defense. They can't get on the court and make sure that we're running these plays correctly. Right? Like, you have to put some of the onus on the, on the players. So, if you if they – uh say they lose tomorrow. Yeah, say they lose tomorrow, do you think they should get rid of them? Like, fire them? I would say No. But I have seen reports that – and it's weird. You never can really gauge what's 100% true or fake. There's always going to be some gray area, especially when you're dealing with, like, beat reporters and what's coming out of rumors of the locker room and whatnot. But mm -hmm. they, they, the reporters of the team, have been saying that there are players who are still don't feel right about how the whole e situation went down. They didn't want him to get suspended. They obviously liked Ime a lot. You know, Jason Tatum was vocal about saying that's his favorite coach that he's ever, you know, played for, um, at least in the NBA side of things. So there's some level of that that I think is true, which may come into consideration. And I did also see that 
him and the owner got into it during this series. Um, I think it was particularly in game three where, um, you know, the owner wanted him to pull Tatum and Brown, like the game was over and he was like ignoring him at first. This was happening on the sideline. Like people mm-hmm. in the arena had eyewitness accounts of this. Um, he turned back and snapped at the owner and was like, I'm going to pull them out when I pull them out, they're going to come out, just relax. And so if they were to get rid of him, I feel like there's some more underlying reasons aside from they'll pin it on this series. Right. Mm-hmm. But to me, this is not an, an indicator of him being a good or a bad coach because he's 34. He was thrown into this position, didn't even get a training camp. When you put all of that into context and in perspective, he had a great year, 57 wins, and you had eight days to prep for the season. Mm-hmm. You didn't get to pick anybody on your staff. Like you just were thrust into this role, you know? So yeah. that, I'm going to give him a lot of slack again likely going to lose this series, but still made the Eastern Conference final, still were a two seed. And some of the issue is the players on the court are not stepping up. We're having inconsistent performances from Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum in the Eastern Conference finals. That cannot happen. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's my thoughts on that. I definitely see what you're saying. It's just, it's going to be interesting um, when they do lose this series because there's going to be a lot of movement. Um, or at least talk of movement in the offseason with the Celtics. But we'll we'll get more into that once they get eliminated. But it, it's just it, – it's going to be real interesting to see, basically, regardless of whether it's coaching movement or player movement as far as talking about misshaking some things up. So it's going to be real interesting to see. For sure. Speaking of coaching movement, no, I'm just going to go around some of the news in the NBA that's come out since the last pod. Um. Shams is reporting the Raptors met with Steve Nash um, for their for their head coaching position, and oh, they God. have uh, they've dwindled down their uh, their final five coaches um, candidates for their their vacancy to Nick Nurse, Frank Vogel, Doc Rivers, um, Kings assistant Jody, Jordy Fernandez, and Suns assistant Kevin Young. Um, with I would imagine the front runners having to be Nick Nurse. And Frank Vogel. But this is Knight. for this is for Phoenix. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So Nick Nurse and Frank and potentially Doc as well, which please no doc. Would be please insane not doc. to go from Monty Williams to Doc. If you go okay, you cannot fire Monty Williams and then say, you know the guy we need, Doc Rivers. <laughs> you cannot do that. Please don't do that. Nick Nurse, okay. But like, come on, bro. And I'm not familiar with the assistants i'm not even act like i do i am but you cannot go from monty williams to doc rivers that just can't happen yeah um and again the 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 raptors i don't think have announced their their finalists for you know their who they're moving forward but um adding steve nash that coaching pool as well um to me i still don't i don't buy the hype on steve nash i thought it was a bad move when they did it in brooklyn and it's I don't think it's indicative of him as a his basketball knowledge, right? Like coaching is different and you can't just go from you were a player. And then he spent some time as I believe an advisor for the Warriors, right. And like kind of a front office role mm-hmm. and then immediately became the head coach. That's the biggest thing, right? You have no experience at doing this before. And then it's such a high pressure situation dealing with the three superstars they had in Brooklyn at the time that it really was just a dumpster fire and that probably is going to give him a really bad rap. But again, it's hard to just get, you can't just become the head coach. Like the trends, you can't just being a great point guard, being a great player does not automatically translate to you becoming a great coach. And we've seen that throughout history. There have been plenty of great players who tried their hand at coaching and were very unsuccessful. Mm-hmm. It's just not – it's a different type of skill set that's required. Uh, so, interested to see what Toronto does there, but um, I, I would stay away from Steve Nash getting a head coaching job, potentially coming on as an assistant, whatever, like let him continue to develop in that way. Cool, but I think there needs to be some more learning and development in that aspect of, from a coaching perspective before he gets another another role like that. Yeah, 100%. Um, other big news that came out, Melo is hanging it up 
after 19 uh, years. Um, just a phenomenal career um, for anybody in our age group will forever be mellow. There's not going to be another mellow. Nah, ever. no way. I don't want to hear no one get had the nickname mellow. Everyone say their full name, bro. There's only one mellow. Right. Um, his, his accolades speak for themselves. 10 time all-star, six time all NBA player, um, all rookie team, arguably should have been rookie of the year that year. Um, made it on the 75th anniversary team, one time <clears throat> scoring champ. Um, one, one of the best one and done basketball players ever going to Syracuse and won the national championship that year for declaring for the draft after his only season in college. Uh, also a very decorated international basketball player was a, a key component of USA basketball for a lot of his time as a pro. Um, led, the, so, led them in scoring, or I think it was like the all-time leader before Kevin. I think Kevin Ryan just passed him, but he was the, the scoring leader over there. Yeah, so phenomenal career. Um, what, what are your thoughts, like if you had to, to summarize Carmelo as a player, um, like how, what would you say? Bucket. Right. That's all you got to say. That's just one word. He's a bucket. <laughs> Carmelo was – he was a lot of fun to watch. You know what I mean? He was – Carmelo was a scorer, nothing more than that, but was so good at that one thing that he made a name for himself. Obviously one of the best – if we're just talking about scoring-wise, like one of the best scorers the league has ever seen. So mm -hmm. um, it's sad that he never really got a real chance to compete for a championship. I think his yeah. best chance was in – Hopefully my memory is right. I think it was like oh nine. It was against like Kobe in the Western oh, yeah. Conference that Finals. Denver I team, yep. Denver Nugget, yeah. So um, but yeah, it's just it's tough. He never got a real chance to 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 compete for a championship, but he brought a lot of fun, a lot of hype back to the Knicks because they were not that great before him. So made yeah. them really, really fun to watch. Um, I used to love watching him watching those Knicks games. Yeah, um, he helped make the Nuggets a little bit re relevant when he was there. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's sad to see him go, man. It's really it's – it's the end of an era, bro. It really is. Like, yeah. him and then, obviously, LeBron's the last of that. But Banana Boat crew is dwindling yeah. down. There's only one left. <sighs> it's tough, man. It's 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 sad to see. But, you know, def obviously, Hall of Famer, great yeah. career. Wish him nothing but the best in his post-basketball life. Yeah, couldn't have said it better, right? If you have to pick one word, it's just buckets. Yeah. I think he probably had the single-handed best triple threat game that we've ever seen in basketball mm -hmm. history. Um, what do they say? He, he could he could make space in a phone booth, right? Yeah, <laughs> my dad always said that. <laughs> he always said that about Melo, but he could make space in a phone booth. Right, but jab, step, you know, bring the ball around, cross around, uh, just – Phenomenal player to watch. One of the best scores of the basketball we've ever seen and probably will ever see. Uh, career 22.5 point per game score, um, even with some of his later seasons, you know, being kind of a bench player in, in Portland mm -hmm. and in Los Angeles as well. Even his last year in L.A., still giving you 13 a night um, on 26 minutes. You know what so I'm saying? Yeah. It's Fair just credit. a bucket. Just a Fair bucket for sure. Credit to him for also accepting his role, you know, taking mm -hmm. that lesser role, and especially knowing that the game has basically changed. You know, when he came into the league, it was mid-range, it was post-scoring, and all that. Mm -hmm. So the league pretty much changed while he was, while he was, you know, not in his prime, a little bit after his prime, but was able to adjust and make himself a viable role player for some teams. So, yeah, uh, shout out to Melo, man. How do, how do you feel about uh, the fact that they gave Jokic 15 in Denver, so now it's, they can never really retire Melo's 15 in Denver? I've seen people talk about that, and I don't feel like this should be that hot of a take. Jokic is better, right? Like, oh yeah, easily. It's not He's in the finals right, right now. It's not to discredit Melo at all, but like, mm -hmm. we are we literally just half an hour ago just had a discussion about Jokic being the best player on the planet right now. Melo mm -hmm. was never in that discussion, right? Like. And that's it's only a very very select group of guys that ever are even in that discussion at any point in their career, and I think Jokic has a legitimate argument to be that guy right now, and for a lot of people has been that guy potentially for the last few seasons, um, and he says now brought them to their first finals in the NBA, 
uh, in NBA history. They made it in the ABA back in the 70s. I think they were in the last actual ABA finals. Um, and so I, it's tough, right? Like, he, 15 for Denver for a long time was. That was Melo's number. Now Jokic is wearing it and doing so much. Yeah, and contributing so much to that now. franchise that um, <clears throat> that's probably going to be lifted up into the Raptors with the Jokic name on it instead of instead of Carmelo. They could um, retire them both though. They could put them like side by side or something. Jokic is obviously going to be better, but yeah, I feel like they. I feel like obviously in the first they should have never gave Jokic fifteen in the first place. Like they already should have like did something to the point where they never even gave him the opportunity. Now, granted, mm-hmm. they didn't know he was going to turn into this, but yeah, still, it's. It's just kind of funny. I feel like they could they could do a little bit of something. Obviously, Jokic is the better player. Like if if you had to choose one to go into the Raptors, unfortunately for Melo, it would be Jokic. But right, it was just it was kind of kind of funny to see people talk about that. Like maybe they can retire both of them, have like a Melo one, have like a Jokic one. But I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, because I think I think the Cowboys technically have eighty eight retired, if I'm not mistaken, under Michael Irvin. Mm-hmm. Um. But that's kind of become a, yeah, they, they retired. Um, I thought they retired 88. But either way, that's kind of become like a, like you give 88 to the best receiver. Yeah. Like when, if you are in that echelon of like an elite receiver playing for the Cowboys, like getting mm-hmm. 88 is like a passing of the torch type of thing. So, Which I think is cool. I like that. I like that idea. I, I think that's pretty cool. Right. Um, I don't know if they'd do that in the NBA, but I think that's a pretty cool idea. If, like, someone's really that guy and they want to wear, I don't know, I can't think of a number, 24 for the Lakers maybe, I don't know. Maybe 20, I don't know, 23 for the Bulls is asking a lot out of this guy. But <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I don't think, think we'll ever cool see concept. that. But something like that, I actually would like to see that in the NBA. That would be cool. So, like, even if they did that in Denver, whoever the next star after Jokic is, it's like, if you become the guy – Nah, you got 15. And that number just right. becomes like an iconic number for the team, for the city. Um, and like this just builds a history on it because it's like they went from Melo to Jokic to whoever comes next. Um, so that'd be cool. That would be interesting to see. That'd be kind of funny though. What if like somebody was like a say like Donovan Mitchell turned into like a Cavs legend or something, and they're like, here, you get 45. And dude's right. like, I want 45. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want that number. Like, that the, sucks. The, the next Dallas <laughs> GOAT is out here wearing 77. 70, yeah, right. <laughs> 77. Like, ew, I don't want to wear that. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um wanted to uh also play a play a little game here. And I was looking on basketball reference for, for Carmelo and it was kind of popped in my head. Um, I want you to try to guess the NBA player based off of their accolades. And then I can give right, like – I'll give like stats, teams they play for, but, but mostly accolades. And I'm going to start – I'm going to start easy, you know, big name, current players, but I'm going to get a little bit, little bit harder as we move on. All right, so bet. Let, me, let me think of a good one first. Let me think of a good one. Ah, let me lock in. <laughs> Test my basketball knowledge real quick. Trying to see. I want I want to start too hard, too fast. Let me see. Um, this is a good one. First guy, four-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA player. His last NBA season was in 2021-22 for the Nuggets. Spent played for the Kings, the Pelicans, the Nuggets. The Warriors, the Rockets, the Clippers, and the Bucks. Wait, he was a four. You said four time All Star. Four time All Star, two time All NBA player, career twenty point per game score. When did he retire? He's a center. When did he retire? Not technically retired, but last year in the league was was twenty one twenty two with Denver. Four time All Star, two time All NBA. Started with the Kings, then went to the Pelicans, then Denver, then Warriors, Rockets, Milwaukee, Clippers. I like kind of journeymaned it out. A what little year bit. did he get drafted? First season was 2010, 2011. Oh my God, I'm blanking. What's that muscle too? Yeah. Okay. I was going to say. Okay. I, I wanted to be like seven seasons with the Kings. That's so obvious. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Let me think of another one. Let me think of another one. Um, ooh, this might be a good one. Okay, thirteen-year uh, guy, still in the league, two-time All-Star, 
2021 NBA champion, five-time All-Defensive team. You all did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. We're gonna, it's crazy because as soon as you said two-time All-Star, I don't know why I instantly thought Drew Holiday because I knew he barely made it, but he made like a couple. Okay, okay. We're going we're gonna to up the difficulty just a little bit. Sky has made two All-Defensive teams, All-Rookie team in 2010. You know, you have to think the teams is what's really going to help. Four seasons on the Clippers, five seasons in Phoenix, three seasons with Milwaukee, and his last year in the league in 2021-22, um, he was with the back with the Clippers after a brief stint with the Pelicans. But started his career with the Clippers and then went to Phoenix. It was like his two most notable spots. And then went to Phoenix, mm-hmm. Clippers, and then Phoenix, and then had three years in Milwaukee. Damn, this yo, this was hard. Like, what is accolades? You said any accolades? Two time All Defensive Team uh, made the All Rookie Team his, his rookie year. You said the in the Clippers. Damn, who was on that Clippers team? Oh, this, so this God. is this is like a a role player on the Lob City Clippers, and then went to the Suns to become a starter. It was like a part of that like three-guard lineup that they used to run. Oh, my God. I'm blanking on this. When I say it's the not, name, you're going to be like. It's not Lou Williams, right? It's not no, 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 no. Yo, I'm blanking on this. I don't know. I don't know this one. That Suns team, uh, they used to have – it was – he used to have Drogic. Um, Eric Blesso. Eric Blesso, yeah. Go. Okay. <laughs> I was about to say, he was running the, the three-guard lineups. Yeah, that, that one was a little tough. The accolades ain't help at all. <laughs> it ain't help nothing. Dang, this is a good one. He had a short career. This is crazy. Um, only accolades that he made the all-rookie team. Um, but had seven seasons in Denver, who is a power forward, and then – just like stinted out of the league, basically like instantly in like two years. Spent some time in Brooklyn, Houston, and now oh, overseas. Man. Oh my God! I know I can see his face. He has dreads. Yeah. Yes. The um, man. The manimal. The manimal. Yes. I forgot his name though. Was it like Fareed? Something like that. Kenneth Fareed. Yeah. Okay. Fareed. <laughs> the manimal. Yo, he used to be a rebounding dog. So he- Boy, I used to go crazy with him in 2K13. He was like 6'8", right? He wasn't even that tall. He was not that tall, yeah. Um, All right, we're going to throw it back a little bit further for these last couple. This is like starting to get to hard, hard difficulty. Got me. (laughs) Seven-time champion. Whoa. Only accolade is that he made the 92 All-Rookie team. Played for the Rockets. One season in Phoenix. Was with the Lakers for seven years from Robert 97. Dory. Yeah, big yeah, shot. Yeah, big Rock. shot. Yeah. You, any Lakers player, I got it. Trust me. I'm going to get it. Any okay. Lakers player, I got it. Okay. You can say Robert Sacre. I'm going to be like, Robert I'm already known. <laughs> the ball legend. This <laughs> guy don't got no accolades. I didn't know that until just now. Six <laughs> eleven <Damn. laughs> <laughs> center. Started his career in 01 with the Wizards, then spent three years with the Lakers, and then was all over the place, Memphis to Detroit to Charlotte to Golden State. Last year in Philly, was getting 12 minutes a night, putting up two points. Mm. So big, biggest stints was in Washington, and then he was in L.A. in 05, 06, and 07. So missed out on all the championships. Literally in that in between run between the three peat and the the my Kobe man, power. my man that combined for eighty three points when Kobe <laughs> scored eighty one Kwame Brown, <laughs> yeah, my God, they combined for eighty three that night. Yeah, Kwame Brown, you see the screens he be saying, bro, <laughs> you, know what you, it be is? Seeing, you be seeing him talk crazy now on the line, <laughs> he be wilding now, bro. Kwame Brown be yeah. tweaking. He is crazy. All right, this this might be the last one, but this is might be the toughest one yet because it, it's just a it's just a deep pull. 
Copy. Eight seasons in Toronto. They'll have no accolade. Six three mm-hmm. point guard. Eight seasons in Toronto. Year in Detroit. Year in Dallas. Two seasons with the Knicks. Then went Lakers, Hawks, Cavs, Detroit, and then out of the league in 2019. So from 05 to 2019 is the, the time span. But started, started his with who? Eight years in Toronto. Eight years in Toronto. Six three. He's a six three point guard. Yes. Uh, in 05. Now this one's gonna stump me. Oh my god. Hmm. You said it was Toronto, then who? Toronto, Detroit, then Dallas, and then I, I would say his next notable stop was in New York for two years. Not Raymond Felton, right? It's not him. No. Eight years in Toronto. He was a staple of those early, early rounds. Jose Calderon? Jose Calderon. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's a good pull. Oh, nice. I got one more because this guy, right, I don't right, know right. why it didn't randomly be popping up in my head when I think about old players. One time All Star, <clears throat> played eight seasons with the Clippers from 03 to 2009, and then bounced around the league for five years. Um, went to the Hornets, Dallas, Lakers, two years in Portland, and then was out of the league uh, as a center. As a center. Eight years with the Clippers. What years is his Lakers years? That's how I'm going to get this one. One year, he was, on, he was on the team 2013, 2014. Bad, I don't bad team. That don't help nothing. Was it – wait, who did he start with? The Clippers. 2009, 2010, he was an all-star. Um, put up 18.5 points and, and 9.5 rebounds that year. Damn. Was he ever on the Timberwolves? Nope. He, wait, he started with – he got drafted to the Clippers in what year? 2003. So he was on the Clippers with, with Ellen Brand. He was the center next to Ellen. Is it uh Antoine Jameson? No. Bugging? Oh, this is tough. He was a center mm-hmm. for the Clippers. This definitely is the hardest one. What does throw me off is that you say he made an All Star team. That's one what year. Throw me one off. year. Yep. I don't think I got this one. I'm not gonna lie. So hey, you got a lot of tougher ones. This one is uh it's Chris Kamen. I wasn't gonna get that one. Yeah. <laughs> I was not gonna get that one. <laughs> as a, as a throwback, <laughs> always funny to look at like old like role players who like we remember from when we was kids. But uh, okay. nah, yeah, that was cool. That was a cool little game. We we'll have to do that more often. Nah, um, sorry, so I like that. But, was cool. Yeah, with that, that's gonna do it for another episode of the Off the Glass Podcast. Um, again, if you're you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Go ahead and drop five stars. We appreciate you for listening as always. Um, I'm Billy Ness Dame, and we out. Yes, sir.